Good morning, First Assembly, and happy Easter. We're so glad that you have joined us here online on YouTube and Facebook. And let me go ahead and remind you before we go any farther, as usual, make sure to share the video. Let people know that the Easter service has already begun. Let your family know that they can join us right where they are at at home. Well, this morning, we've got a great message for you. We're going to be taking communion together in just a little while. And uh, if you already have the communion elements, wonderful. If you don't have communion elements, if you weren't able to make it up on Friday, why don't you go ahead and run to your refrigerator, run to your pantry, see if you've got some crackers or some juice or something that you'll be able to join us with uh, in just a few minutes. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful time doing that. We have some worship coming up in just a moment as well. And uh, before we get any further, just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your continued faithfulness and your giving of tithes and offerings and missions. Uh, it means so much to the church and the missionaries and to the evangelists that we've had the last couple of days. And uh, let me remind you, tonight at 7 p.m., tonight at 7 p.m., saying that twice so you don't forget it, Chris Clock is going to be speaking again and he's already had a, uh, two wonderful messages that hopefully all of you have heard if you haven't go back and listen to them uh, they are already posted on youtube and facebook for you to see and uh, join us tonight so let's go ahead and pray we're going to take this moment we're going to share with you how you can give online as well as being able to mail in and then we'll be moving right into a time of worship well god we love you Lord, we thank you because today we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We are so happy. We are so excited. We are so thankful, God, that you have done so much for us, that you have come after us. Lord, knowing that there's nothing that we could have done to earn salvation. There's nothing that we do that gives us the right, but it's all in what your son Jesus has already done. He died on the cross, and then three days later, today we celebrate the resurrection. God, we, we cannot say thank you enough. Our excitement wells up within us. And this morning, God, I pray that this excitement, I pray that the expectation would rise up right there in all of our living rooms where we're at. God, that your spirit would move mightily this morning, that we would feel and know that your presence is real and with us and that our children would feel your presence this morning right where they're at. God, I pray that today that there will be such a movement of your spirit in our homes that we can't help but uh, just uh, shout amen and start to just praise your name because you are so good to us because of what you've done for us and because we know that, that because of all of what you've done, because of what Jesus did, we have a hope. We have a hope to see you in heaven one day, to be with you face to face with our Savior, with our God. And because of that, God, we say thank you. And today we pray your presence would just permeate our services, would permeate our living rooms. And throughout the day, God, that you'll stay with us. And when we come back for service tonight, that we come back with an expectant heart to be changed by your word, to be moved by your spirit, and to be prompted to take action and tell of our testimonies of who our God is and what he has done. So today, Lord, have your way. Today, move among your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So much stronger, the King of Glory, the King of Glory. 
amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for Take my
assembly of God. This is that special time of the year that we proclaim and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But you know, before you can get to the resurrection, you have to have the cross. There is no victory without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And while we are celebrating today that Jesus has, is alive, that he was raised from the dead, we also must reflect. We must also proclaim his death I want to read to you Isaiah 53. So many hundreds of years before Jesus came and suffered and died on the cruel cross, the prophet Isaiah got a glimpse of it, and he prophesied this concerning the suffering servant. He said, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of a parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But listen, he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The well-being, uh, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord, the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. But listen to this. 
But the Lord was pleased to crush him. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offering offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured himself out unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. What a powerful prophetic revelation of the suffering of Jesus prophesied hundreds of years before the Roman cross, the Roman crucifixion was even thought of. And yet uh, the prophet Isaiah with such precision describes the suffering of Jesus, describes his crucifixion, describes his death on behalf of us as a guilt offering for many. Well, we have come at this special time on this most holy day for us as Christians. But you know something? We don't have to just celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on April 12th or whenever the calendar tells us that it is uh, Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every day. The Apostle Paul said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. So we not only uh, celebrate today, but we celebrate every day that our God is alive and that He has overcome he has overcome death, hell, and the grave. And so today we're celebrating. We are celebrating. There's joy in our hearts because we serve a risen Savior. And He is alive and He is here amongst us. The Lord is present today. The Lord is present today. He's right there with you in your living room. He's right there with your family. Jesus by His Spirit is with us today as we join around the table. The longest table. The table where all God's people gather to participate in what is known as communion, the Lord's Supper, this most important and most holy of times. We have uh, distributed to some that have come by the church this uh, last week and picked up these uh, pre-sealed communion elements. If you have yours there, I encourage you to take it, distribute it there to your family, to your children. But others maybe didn't come to the church and pick them up. Hey, God sees our heart. We're not going to get real legalistic about it and say you've got to have this or have that. You do the best you can and use the best you can. And those elements, they're representative anyhow. This is not the body and blood of Jesus. This is only a symbol. This is only a representation. There's, there's nothing in this that's going to save you or make you more holy uh, or, or more spiritual. It is what Jesus and it is Jesus and what Jesus did that imparts grace and salvation unto us. But nonetheless, if you have the elements, I want to invite you to take them in your hand and prepare as we uh, lead this communion supper together. Let's begin with a word of prayer, asking that God would sanctify this time that He'd sanctify our hearts and sanctify these elements so that we may receive them with thanksgiving, ever mindful of what they represent and who they represent, the body and blood of Jesus, His suffering, His atoning death on our behalf. Heavenly Father, we come to You today, and this day that we celebrate, we celebrate all the time. Jesus is alive every day of the year. But nonetheless, this is the, the day that we have designated to proclaim and to celebrate with Your uh, church, Your family, the resurrection of Jesus. And Lord, we come now to the table. And God, even though we are not in proximity physically to one another, I pray that our hearts would be joined more closely together now than ever before. That the unity of the Spirit would prevail in this congregation for those who are joining us near and far. God, that your Holy Spirit would join us together. And that this, this communion supper that we share, the communion of the saints would be something that would serve to bring greater unity and greater love, the body one for another. We ask it now that you sanctify us, sanctify this time, sanctify this space. And Lord, these elements, these humble representations that we bring to honor you and to remember and proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, if you have the elements, I want to ask you to do something. The easiest thing to do is to take the, the clear film first. And if you take the, the foil off, you're going to struggle. If you take the clear film first off, it will expose the bread. It will expose the bread. So don't go for the foil. Go for the plastic covering there. Expose the bread. Let's take the bread in our hand and let's read the word of the Lord. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, the Apostle Paul said, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you now with thanksgiving and faith take the emblem of the bread, the emblem of the body, and would you now share with us as we eat together? Lord, we thank you for your body broken nearly 2,000 years ago at a cross at Calvary. We thank you, Lord God, that you bore 39 stripes for the healing of our bodies. You were nailed to that tree, and the blood flowed forth from your riven side for the salvation of our souls. So, Lord God, now as we partake together of this uh, emblem, our faith is not in the emblem. Our faith is in the reality that Jesus and him crucified is the only source of salvation and healing for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. And we receive it as such in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. In the same way, the apostle went on to say he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together of the symbol of his blood that was shed. And now would you join me in offering up thanksgiving to the Lord? Would you lift your hands right there where you are in your living room with your family? Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today that you were willing to lay down your life for me. You said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down. You laid down your life for us. You shed your blood so that we might be beneficiaries of the new covenant. The new covenant, not in the blood of bulls and goats, but in the eternal covenant of the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb that was slain so that the sin of the world might be removed. God, we thank you today that we, that we have been blessed by the covenant of grace that you have extended to us the free offer of salvation. And Lord, we not only reflect on what you did, we celebrate what you are doing, but Lord, we are also looking forward until you come again for your church. Lord, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, and we also proclaim that you are coming again for your church. And one day, Lord God, we will all be together, all God's people, not only of this generation, but of all generations and we'll be gathered around the table and we will partake of the wedding supper of the Lamb. And what a glorious, glorious day it will be. So God, we ask now your continued blessing upon each person in their homes and in their hearts. And through this broadcast today, we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. There is victory in the house of the Lord. There is joy and celebration because Jesus is alive and we are the beneficiaries of every good thing that he has purchased for us at Calvary by the price of his own blood. And there is salvation, there is healing, there is deliverance for you today. Peace in your heart and joy in your soul. Good things God has promised to them that love him. So let us rejoice and receive it. Receive it gladly. Receive it with faith that it is coming. God bless you this morning.
It is a joy to be able to share with you the Word of God on this Resurrection Sunday. I can think of no better day to be able to preach than on this day. Hey, we've got the greatest story the world has ever heard, and the best part about it, it's true. It is a fact. Jesus came, Jesus suffered, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus was raised from the dead, and He is alive. He is alive today and alive forevermore. And we have the privilege, we have the honor of being able to proclaim to the world the good news. That's why the gospel is called good news, because friends, it is good news. It is the good news that our God is alive and He is well. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles right there where you are. Gather your family together. Open your Bibles. Follow along. Don't just watch this broadcast. Participate in this broadcast. You know, we as Pentecostal people do things a little different. When we have our services, we are all participants in what we're doing. So we don't just sit and let somebody sing to us. We all sing. When we sing, we all sing. And a true Pentecostal offering, when we give, we all give. And you know what? In true Pentecostal preaching, when we preach, we all preach. So I'm not just going to preach. I'm encouraging you to enter into the Word and say amen and, and claim it and grab it and hold on to it and appropriate yourself of it and believe that God is speaking to you personally today through the message that He has given me for this most wonderful resurrection morning. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we're going to read verse 1 through 18 because it is a story that is worth reading and proclaiming over and over and over again. Jesus is alive. Now on the first day of the week, the Bible tells us, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was, sti while it was still dark. And I want you to put your finger there. While it was still dark. And saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John himself, John the Evangelist, John the Apostle. He is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter. And came to the tomb first, and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed." And yet, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting on one, at one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she, said, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, listen, and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. I love the Bible, I love the Gospels, but I do have a favorite. You probably shouldn't have favorites. You shouldn't have favorite children, but I have a favorite Gospel. I have a favorite evangelist, and it is John the Apostle. 
John the Evangelist is my favorite of all the four Gospels, and I have reasons for that that, that I, I can't share all of them today. But John weaves a powerful story, a powerful narrative from the very beginning to the very end. He is, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a master, a master writer and storyteller. In fact, John the Apostle prevents, presents excuse me, from beginning to end a very interesting motif in his gospel. From the very beginning, chapter 1, all the way to the resurrection, John presents the eternal conflict between light and darkness. And this conflict is revealed in the that passage of Scripture we just read, but it's also revealed in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John. Now why do I say that? Because John the Apostle, John the Evangelist, gives us a detail, gives us something very specific concerning the circumstances of the resurrection. He tells us that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark. Now Jesus had already arisen from the dead, but Mary came and it was still dark. Now we might just read that and, and, and think that he's just painting a word picture, but let me tell you something, John the Evangelist through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is very specific and giving us details because he laid out something in the first chapter of the Gospel of John that finds its climax, that finds its culmination here at the empty tomb. The conflict is revealed. Listen to what John the Evangelist has to say about the struggle between the darkness and the light in his very first uh, chapter of John in the prologue. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. Look at this. In Him, in Christ, was life. And the life was the light of men. But look at verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, the light is not, as some would think, an inanimate, impersonal, cosmic force. The light that gives life to all men is the person of Jesus Christ. You know, John records seven I am statements that Jesus made during his 33 and a half years here on planet earth. He said, I'm the bread of life. He said, I'm the door. He said, I'm the good shepherd. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the true vine. But in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus made this declaration that is consistent with what John the evangelist said in the prologue. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Hallelujah! So when we think of light, we think of an inanimate force. We think of something that can be explained by some scientific or natural understanding of phenomena or something that we would understand. But friends, I'm talking about a light that doesn't come from the sun. I'm talking about a light that is empowered by any kind of machine or any kind of apparatus. I'm talking about the personification of the eternal, true, living light that gives life unto men. I'm talking to you today about Jesus Christ, the light of the world. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23, it describes a city. A city that where, in where there is never any night. A city of eternal day. A city where there's never any darkness. And the Bible tells us of that city that that city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of, the, of God has illuminated it. Listen. And its lamp is the Lamb. Hallelujah. The Lamb is the lamp thereof, the Bible tells us. Imagine if the sun were to be extinguished, there would be no more light on planet earth, and as a result, there would be no more life. But the Bible tells us here that the city to which we are destined has no need of the sun by day nor the moon by night because the glory of God has illuminated it and Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the lamp thereof and there is no darkness in that place. We're talking about John. 
We're talking about John the Master, the master storyteller. We're talking about John the Evangelist, anointed, inspired of God. Usually a good writer, listen, lays out the plot and brings it to a climax. But we would think that a good writer doesn't give away the ending, doesn't give away the ending at the beginning of the book. But John, John cannot contain himself. John cannot wait to tell you the good news. John cannot wait to get to the end of the story to tell you how it's all going to end. He can't leave his readers in suspense. John tells us in the very beginning how this thing is going to end. John says in John 1, 5, The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. I'm here today to tell you that the light is still shining. Jesus is still the life of men. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Most scholars believe that even that an even more exact translation of the phrase that the light, the darkness did not comprehend the light, that a more exact translation of, the, of this phrase is that the darkness could not overcome or overpower or extinguish the light. So it is a settled fact, the great triumph of Christ over all of the forces and foes of darkness that have been arrayed against Him. And John in the very first verses of his gospel reveals that there is a struggle between darkness and light. And not only does the darkness not comprehend the light, but listen to me, the darkness is unable to overcome, overpower, or extinguish the light of God. Jesus is the light. And the Jesus has overcome the darkness. The Bible tells us this in some of the other Gospels of the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Each of us tell us that when Jesus was crucified, great darkness came upon the earth during those three hours that Jesus was hanging on the cross. Matthew 27, 45, for example, it says now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. From noon... Until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, darkness came upon the earth. Think about it. The hours when the sun shines brightest were filled with darkness. But friends, the darkness was not able to overcome the light. Now we go back to John in his gospel. John tells us that on the first day of the week, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Why does John tell us? that it was still dark. It's not just to add drama. It's not just to paint a word picture and give us a detail that is insignificant and irrelevant to the story. But it is consistent with John's theme of the struggle between darkness and light that was established in the very first verses of the book. In fact, if you will read the Gospel of John, and if you will read it with this understanding and pay attention every time it mentions the Bible mentions, John mentions that it was dark or that it was night. You will see that it is always, it is always indicative of something more. It is always revealing something spiritual that is happening. I can give you just three examples. Mary comes to the tomb while it is still dark. We see that. I can show you another one just a little bit before, three days before, when Judas betrayed Jesus. When Judas betrayed Jesus after the Last Supper. Judas, Jesus says, whoever dips the morsel and, and I hand it to him, he's going to betray me. And the Bible says in John 13, 30, that so after receiving the morsel, Judas went out immediately. This is, the, this is when he's going out to betray Jesus. And John the evangelist says, after having received the morsel, Judas went out immediately. And then he adds this, and it was night. Why does he tell us it was night? Because he wants to show that Judas is going into the darkness. That Judas is stepping away from the light. That Judas has rejected and turned his back upon the light who is the life of man. And he is going out into the darkness in order to go into agreement with ungodly, unholy men in order to bring about the death and the crucifixion of Jesus. But I want to focus on this one. Friends, not only when Mary came to the tomb... Jesus had already been raised from the dead, but Mary did not yet know that Jesus was alive. Mary was still in darkness. And friends, this demonstrates the first area of darkness 
that Jesus has overcome. Number one, Jesus overcame the darkness of spiritual ignorance. Now, when we use the term ignorance, some people might think if we're being offensive. We're calling somebody dumb or we're saying somebody doesn't have the mental capacity. No, ignorance is uninformed. Ignorance is when there is truth that a person does not yet know. It is not a put down. It is not a, a statement of arrogance. It's not a statement to demean anybody. It is just stating the fact that there that person is uninformed and doesn't know about this or that. Well, let me tell you, Mary went to the tomb in spiritual ignorance. Because by the time she got there, Jesus was already alive. But she was still in darkness. Because she was ignorant to the reality of Christ's resurrection. John makes the point to tell us that Mary came and it was dark. John also makes the point to tell us, listen, that when Nicodemus in John chapter 3 came to inquire of Jesus, it was also dark. We're talking about the darkness of spiritual ignorance. We're talking about people who do not know, who do not see, who cannot understand, who have not yet experienced the revelation, the illumination of the Spirit that comes when we know who Jesus is and that He is alive and that He is with us. In John's Gospel, chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. And he was a ruler of the Jews. But look at this. This man came to Jesus by night. This man came to Jesus by night. Why does John tell us that he came to Jesus by night? Because John is wanting us to understand that although Nicodemus was a religious man, he was an educated man, he was a respected man, he was a man who was walking in spiritual darkness, the darkness of spiritual ignorance, because he did not yet know Jesus Christ. He came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know you've come from God. And he begins to interrogate Jesus. But Jesus doesn't even wait for Nicodemus to ask the question before Jesus gives him the answer. And he says to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you will not inherit the kingdom. You will not be able to see or enter in to the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? And Jesus answered to him very, very telling, very revealing. In John chapter 3 verse 9 and 10, Jesus answered Nicodemus and said this, Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? That's Jesus' polite way of saying, Nicodemus, you're blind. You are the blind leading the blind. You are in darkness. You are spiritually ignorant. And you are a teacher of Israel. And you should know better. But yet you don't even understand this that I am telling you. It is to, it is to Nicodemus that we have that most wonderful of Scripture. I remember as a, as a boy sitting on my grandfather's lap. And he used to love to watch baseball. And I'd sit on his lap and they would pan the... The audience out there, the, the spectators at the, at the baseball uh, stadiums. And of course people would wave when they saw that they were on the cameras they do today. And my grandfather would tell me that they were waving at me. And I'd start waving back. And he had me convinced that they could see me and that I could see them and they could see me. And I'd be waving at the people because my grandfather told me that they were waving at me. But one other thing I remember that was so common, so prevalent... In those days, and you don't see it anymore, is that there would always be someone out there with a sign up that said John 3.16. And at a, at a vacation Bible school as a young boy, one of the first passages of Scripture, perhaps the first verse that I ever memorized was John 3.16. And it is to Nicodemus who came to Jesus when he was still in spiritual darkness and ignorant of the life that is in Christ that Jesus said those most powerful, those most profound, those most beautiful words, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus went on to say God did not send the Son into to the world to judge the Son, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten of the Son. And then verse 19 of chapter 3, Jesus in interview with Nicodemus at night, Jesus said this, this is the judgment. This is the verdict. 
The final analysis is this, that the light has come into the world. But men, men love darkness rather than light. And I think about when they were offered Jesus or Barabbas, and they had a choice. And the crowd, the crowd instigated by the religious leaders, instigated by the Pharisees, instigated by the, instigated by the rulers of the temple, and the crowd chose darkness over light. The Bible says that the, that the, that the light has come into the world, but men, men love darkness rather than light, and they chose Barabbas over Jesus. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Amen. Jesus performed many diverse miracles while he was here on earth. And I happen to believe that Hebrews 13.8 is true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I don't just read about what Jesus did and say, Oh, isn't that wonderful? Uh, Isn't that a beautiful story? Isn't that nice that Jesus used to do these things? When I read about what Jesus did in the Gospels, I get excited because this is good news. The good news is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still doing what He once did. Hallelujah! In fact, He's no longer limited by a geographical place or a specific time but He is in all places and at all times wherever men and women will put their faith in Him. Jesus is able to save and able to heal and able to deliver. What were some of the miracles Jesus did? He cleansed lepers. He calmed the tempest. He multiplied the bread and the fish. He cast out demons. He made the lame to walk. He made the dumb to speak. He made the deaf to hear. And friends, He made the blind to see. When we think of darkness, when we think of spiritual ignorance, when we think of being blind, there is no greater darkness or greater blindness than to be ignorant of the revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. To know Jesus as the Son of God and as the Savior of all mankind is to have our spiritual eyes opened and it is to step out of darkness and into the glorious light. Some people think that we as Christians, as people of faith, and some people maybe believe this, that, that walking by faith, living in faith, that Christian people, that God, God's people, that we are leaping in the dark. Talk about a leap in the dark. Friends, we don't leap in the dark. We, le- we leapt out of darkness and into the glorious light. We are not people who go around leaping in the dark, but our God is a God who illuminates the path of His people so that we will know and we will understand what it is to know Jesus. Nicodemus was a religious and even a teacher of religion, but he was in darkness. Nicodemus was a moral and good man, but for him it was still night. Nicodemus was educated and esteemed by the community, but he was still blind. Like Nicodemus, there are multiplied millions who are in darkness right now and separated from the life of God that is found in Christ Jesus. But the good news is that the darkness, the darkness, John said in John 1, 5, the darkness was not able to extinguish the light. Oh, it tried. It tried to to extinguish the light of the world. And for three days, it was dark on planet Earth. But friends, the good news is that Jesus overcame the darkness of spiritual ignorance. Darkness has been trying for 2,000 years to overcome the light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. But here we are proclaiming His death, burial, and resurrection, His victory over death, hell, and the grave. Because Jesus overcame, we are no longer in darkness. Isaiah prophesied and Matthew confirmed in Matthew 4.16, the people who were sitting in darkness have seen a great light. And those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has dawned. Praise the Lord. Jesus not only overcame the darkness of spiritual ignorance, but listen to me, Jesus also overcame the darkness of sin. Jesus overcame the darkness of sin. In John's Gospel, chapter 3, the passage we just read, his interview with Nicodemus, he says to Nicodemus, Men 
love darkness rather than light, for their deeds, <laughs> excuse me, were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. The light of holiness is always contrasted in the Bible with the darkness of sin. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord gave us this invitation. He said, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Friends, I have observed something, and it is confirmed in the Word, and there's a spiritual reason behind it, that sinners enjoy sinning most at night. That sinners enjoy sinning most at night. Now, we have neighbors in our neighborhood. It seems like every, everywhere we moved here, we always end up with one neighbor. We have a neighbor who throws big drunken parties. And the worst part about it is that they never do it during the day. In fact, their parties don't usually start. Listen to what I'm about to say to you. They don't start their parties till about 9 o'clock at night. I have pet parties at my house. We never start our party. By 9 o'clock, we're ending our party and cleaning up. These people don't start their party until 9 o'clock in the evening, until it is dark. Then they start their drunken revelry. They wait until the cover of darkness to begin their party. Why? There's actually a spiritual reason for it. And it is this man instinctively knows that what he is doing is wrong. And man instinctively tries to cover his sin in the shroud of the darkness of night. This is biblical. The Bible confirms it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 4. But you brethren are not in the darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light, listen, and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, so let us not sleep as others who do, but let us be alert. Listen to this and sober. Listen verse 7. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. Listen. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But we are of the day. Let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. If you don't believe me, just ask a, a police officer or ask a police dispatcher, and they will tell you that crime and violence are more prevalent in the darkness of night. In the darkness of night. That's why people in places of violence are afraid to go out of their house at night. Oh, it's gotten to where they're so brash and so brazen that even in the day, but, but there is something about the cover of night that seems to embolden people to sin. And it seems to be the hour in which people most engage in sinful behavior. But I got good news for you. Jesus overcame the darkness of sin. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, 7, Do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of life consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of these things which are done by them in secret. Or in other words, under the cover of night. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See, there used to be darkness in our souls, and it was the darkness, it was the darkness of the taint of sin. And there was something in us that loved darkness more than light. But when Jesus came, He overcame the darkness of sin. And now we love Jesus more than we love alcohol. We love Jesus more than we love drugs. We love Jesus more than we like fornicating or any other kind of sexual perversion. We love Jesus more than we love stealing or, or murdering or lying or gossiping or any other thing. Because Jesus has overcome the darkness of sin in our hearts. We were once slaves to sin and we could not overcome it. But Jesus overcame the darkness of sin and has given us the victory of sin so that we might no longer be slaves to sin. But now, my friends, you and I are servants of righteousness. One of the passages of Scripture that I wrote in my Bible, the Exodus, 
I wrote this my personal Exodus, Colossians 1.13. I wrote in my Bible, my Exodus. In this one verse, it describes my Exodus and your Exodus, just like the story of the children of Israel who came out of the kingdom of darkness, of Pharaoh's slavery, and, uh, and the Lord, it took them 40 years, but we can condense the five books of the Pentateuch into this one verse. For He, Jesus, rescued us from the domain of darkness, that's Egypt, and He transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. That's the land that flows with milk and honey, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that wonderful to know that Jesus overcame the darkness of spiritual ignorance, and Jesus overcame the darkness of sin. But let me tell you, Jesus also overcame the darkness of hopeless sorrow. Of godless sorrow. There's a godly sorrow. There is a sorrow of repentance that, that is good. I'm not telling you you always have to be happy. I'm not telling you God exists to always make you happy. I'm not. There are times that I have sorrow. and I, There's times I should have sorrow. It's a godly sorrow. It's a sorrow that leads to repentance. But what I'm telling you today is that Jesus overcame the darkness of hopeless sorrow. Of godless sorrow. And there we live in a world filled with people who are walking in darkness. And it is the darkness of godless, hopeless sorrow. We all experience moments of sadness. But there is a sorrow that robs and destroys the very soul of man. Winston Churchill wrote and would comment because he experienced seasons of despair and even seasons of depression. And he personified his feelings. He described it in a, in a, in a personification in a way that I think is very fitting and, and something that I think we can understand. He would speak of, of the, the black dog. And there were times in his life when he would hit those valleys when he would begin to experience this kind of profound sadness and despair and even depression. And he would say that his black dog had reappeared and that his black dog was following him. You know, sometimes t people talk about a dark cloud hanging over us or something like that. It's, that. it's that time of hopelessness and that time of sorrow. Hopeless sorrow causes the world to look gray and dark. It seems as though it is always night. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still night. She was in despair. She was experiencing hopeless sorrow. And the angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And they, she said, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid Him. She had no hope. There is no hope in her reply. Then Jesus stands before her, but she can't even recognize that, she, that He is there with her because the darkness of hopeless sorrow prevents her from seeing that Jesus is right there with her. And friends, there are people, there are times that we are so uh, blinded, we are so covered in the darkness, hopelessness, that Jesus is standing right there and we can't even see Him. We can't even see that Jesus is right there in front of us, that Jesus is right there with us, because like Mary, our tears, it's a veil of tears, our tears prevent us from being able to see clearly that the reason we are crying is because we have no hope. But Jesus is standing right in front of us. And Jesus is the God of all hope. Jesus is the source of life. And He is the source of power. And Jesus appeared to her and she couldn't see Him. And the Lord said, why are you weeping? And Jesus called out her name, Mary. And at that moment, when Jesus called out her name, she stepped out of darkness and into the light. At that moment, listen to me, when Jesus said her name, at that moment, night gave way to the eternal day that Jesus has promised. Do you remember the day when He called your name? Do you remember the pit in which you were, the despair, the darkness, the sorrow, the sadness, the hopelessness that had, had engulfed you? But then, but then the Master, but then Jesus, the crucified and risen Savior, He called out your name into the darkness of despair in which you found yourself. And when Jesus said your name, hallelujah, the darkness was overcome by the light and the night in which you were living gave way to eternal day. The sorrow of death is, in my opinion, the greatest of all sorrows. The death 
The sorrow of death seems final. It seems as though to be a sorrow that will last forever. But I want to assure you today that for God's people it is not so. Because Jesus not only overcame spiritual ignorance and overcame sin, the darkness of sin, but let me assure you today that the resurrection stands as a eternal testament that Jesus has overcome the darkness of hopeless despair. Jesus tell, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we're nearing our conclusion here, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 the Apostle Paul writes and he says, Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant about those who are asleep. When do people sleep? At night. Those who are in the darkness. So that you will not grieve. Listen. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. The Apostle Paul said that we do not, he did not say that we do not grieve. We will have grief. We will have sorrow. We will have sadness. But what he did say is that we do not grieve as those who have no hope. This is not a hopeless, godless sorrow. This is a sorrow that has hope because we have the knowledge of Jesus Christ and we know that he has obtained the ultimate victory for us. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, then God will also bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Listen, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. with the voice, And it's not going to be a shout of a wail of mourning. It's going to be a shout of joy. With the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain be caught up together and meet the... Clouds in the, and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then the Apostle Paul says, Comfort one another with these words. So our sorrow is not a hopeless sorrow. Our sorrow is not a godless sorrow. Jesus overcame that sorrow. And when He said my name, when He said your name, friends, we knew that everything had changed. Jesus overcame the hopeless sorrow of death when He rose from the dead. We have sorrow, but not a hopeless sorrow. Jesus, John tells us that Mary <clears throat> came to the tomb while it was still night. John tells us that Mary was weeping. But listen, we have a promise that the night will not last forever. And that weeping will give way to joy. In Psalm 30 verse 5, the psalmist said, His anger is for a moment, but His favor, His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping! may last for the night, but shout of joy comes in the morning. Good news on this Resurrection Sunday, Jesus overcame. We don't have to continue in darkness. The darkness of spiritual ignorance has been overcome. We have the revelation that Jesus is the light of the world. The darkness of sin. We no longer are slaves to the prince of darkness, but Jesus has made us servants of righteousness. Listen to me, listen to me. You don't have to keep living that way. Jesus has overcome the darkness of sin. You no longer have to be a slave to those uh, carnal passions that bring death and destruction into your spirit, soul, and body. Jesus has overcome the darkness of sin. And not only that, Jesus has overcome the darkness of hopeless sorrow. Oh, we may grieve in this world, but it is not like those who have no hope. The song says it so well, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. See, the resurrection is what, what uh, tells us of what happened with Jesus in the past. But it is also a prophecy, and it is also a, a revelation of, of what God is going to do for us in the future. Friends, because He lives, because He lives, we can face tomorrow because our God is alive and our God has overcome. The devil threw everything he had at Jesus. I mean, the devil did his very best to try to extinguish the light, but the light would not be extinguished. I'm reminded of something very silly, but something that I think will illustrate it. Perhaps you've had it done to you, they bring you a birthday cake it's full of candles and you blow out the candles. And I was told you had to blow them all out in one, in one, one puff. You had to try to blow them all out. 
And they bring a birthday cake to you filled with candles. And you blow as hard as you can. And the candles go out. But then, a few seconds later, the candles reignite. And they start burning again. Friends, I can imagine that that day the devil did his very best to extinguish the light. To blow out, to extinguish, to overcome, to overpower the light of the world. And for three days, it looked, it appeared, he thought that darkness had succeeded in overcoming the light. But John told us all the way in chapter 1 verse 5 not to despair even when it looked dark because he said the darkness will not comprehend, will not overcome, will not extinguish the light. And friends, three days later the light began to shine once again. The glory of God burst forth in that tomb and Jesus is alive and He is continuing to shine upon the hearts of men and women as they turn to Him. As we close out this time together, I want to encourage you, I want to ask you, I want to implore you. You might feel like you're living in darkness right now. You might feel like there's no joy in your life. There's no hope. There's no reason to go forward. You might feel like the lifestyle you've been living that you have no choice. That you can't, you can't overcome it. You can't stop doing these things. You know they're bad. You know they hurt you. They hurt others. But you can't seem to stop doing it. I've got good news for you. Jesus overcame. Jesus overcame hopeless sorrow. And Jesus overcame the darkness of sin. And Jesus also overcame the darkness of spiritual ignorance. You may be religious. You may go to church. You may be a good moral person. But if you don't know Jesus as the Son of God and as your personal Lord and Savior, if you put your faith in anything other than Him, my friend, you are walking in spiritual ignorance. In order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must be born again. It's a miracle brought by the power of the Holy Spirit as He causes us to have faith in Christ. And as we have faith in Christ, He comes in and He becomes our Savior and Lord. So I want to ask you right now to bow your head right there in your living room where you are. I want to ask you today to pray and ask Jesus to come. Come. Jesus overcame and He wants to give you the victory over darkness. Would you say this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I know that I have sinned and I know that I need a Savior. I have tried other things. I have tried to be a good person. But I recognize, I recognize today that there is no other Savior. There is no other hope but Jesus. I believe that Jesus came, that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And I believe and confess that Jesus was raised from the dead and is alive forevermore. I invite you now, Lord Jesus, come into my life and overcome the darkness of sin and sorrow and make me whole. I surrender to you and ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, if you were sincere, if you meant it, friend, let me tell you, a miracle has just happened right there in your living room. You have been born again. That which Nicodemus didn't even understand. You're a new person. You're a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. Your past no longer matters. It, the, the slate has been wiped clean. You're a new person in Jesus. And so if that is you and you've made that declaration and you believe it in your heart, I want you to call us. I want you to email us. I want you to let us know because we want to be able to minister to you. Tell somebody right there in your living room. Tell whoever invited you to watch this broadcast. Come to First Assembly of God and, and continue to be uh, built up and discipled and grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he, he will do great and awesome things in your life. I believe it. I know it because He's done it in me. And if He can do it in me, He can do it in anybody. Let me tell you, Jesus overcame and He is still overcoming. Amen. Well, as we conclude this wonderful resurrection morning, I invite you to lift your hands toward heaven. As I pronounce, as I do every Sunday from this pulpit, I pronounce His blessing upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you 
and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.